where, for example, um, a series of suicide bombs in Damascus, in one petrol station in Damascus, more than 300 people were killed. And this was by the Muslim Brotherhood faction. So the Muslim Brotherhood has always been an instrument of power. It's always been an instrument. It was created really by British intelligence in Egypt, and it's always been used as, as a political tool to achieve the aims of um, the globalist governments in, in the UK and in the US, and actually even by Israel. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this time is no different. They've effectively used, the Free Syrian Army was Muslim Brotherhood. Of course, when they realized they weren't going to achieve the result of overthrowing the Syrian government, they started to power multiply it. Excuse me, so you're saying the Muslim Brotherhoods that were in Syria at yeah. the time, so they thought once they sent yeah. mercenaries in, yeah. then they would gang together. Yeah. Yeah. Because then basically what happens, if you look at the early protests, of course they all started on a Friday afternoon as they came out of the mosque. Right. So this wasn't, you know, this wasn't a popular uprising, this was the uprising of one faction within Syria, which was being armed and financed and power multiplied by the US coalition. When they realized that, that this moderate army was not going to be powerful enough um, to overthrow the Syrian government, in my opinion, that's when they started to send in Al-Qaeda and ISIS. I mean, I don't see any difference between Al-Qaeda and ISIS other than who's funding them. Qatar is funding Al-Qaeda and Saudi Arabia is funding ISIS, but it's the same ideology. And they're both, they're all uh, tools of the U.S. coalition. They're all proxies of the U.S. coalition in Turkey and Israel, um, etc. inside Syria. Yeah. So certain factions were mobilized predominantly. Um, the Sunni Muslim extremist factions, the Muslim Brotherhood, probably because they were offered um, the holy grail of governance if they got rid of um, the, the current government. Because a Muslim Brotherhood government is always going to be more compliant um, with U.S. agenda in the region. Um, this lady has been very patient. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to know, could you speak a little, little bit about Georgia's involvement in all of this? Yeah. Um, uh, Jordan very early on, um, Ali Hashem actually resigned, a journalist actually resigned from Al Jazeera because he was reporting that militants and weapons were pouring uh, into Syria from Jordan. Um, Al Jazeera basically refused to air that report and he resigned. Um, that was very early on. The White Helmets were trained in Jordan very early on also. I mean, Jordan I see a little bit as an outpost of Britain. Um, although now, since the border has reopened, um, economic relations, trade relations have picked up again with Syria. But basically the Jordan border, um, while the south of Syria was occupied, and those extremist groups were being armed not only by Israel, but also by Jordan or through Jordan. America had its um, operations route in Jordan for, for the south. So all of the southern um, militant groups were controlled by the US coalition war rooms in Jordan. So if you like, Jordan played a role as a satellite state for the US coalition and allowed its territory to be exploited in order to weaken Syria. Um, what is interesting though, that since Israel evacuated the White Helmets into Jordan, one Jordanian MP that I'm in touch with, Tariq Khoury, actually publicly asked in Parliament, why are we taking these terrorists in? They should be repatriated to Syria um, to be tried for their crimes. They are terrorists. We don't want them on our soil. So he made a very public statement that, that he was not happy with supporting um, these, these terrorists who had effectively worked to destabilize Syria for the last eight years. Um, so, I'm hoping that things may stabilize with Jordan now that, as I said, trade relations are open. It seems that there are more people within Parliament who are pro-Syria now. 
So, you know, eventually Syria has to repair relations with all its neighbors, including Turkey. Um, and that's, to some degree, that's where Russia has come in, because Russia is acting as intermediary between Syria and the hostile states that are bordering. We're allowed to go until about 9.20, so... Okay. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's two news stories um, uh, that have kind of, like, always hovered around the fringes, but have then go quiet for a while. I, I think you might have touched on one of them just now. So one of them is that after the, the white helmets were set up in Jordan in, a, in an isolated camp... Jordan that, and Turkey. Uh, right. Well, in particular in Jordan, that some Canadian immigration agents, who I guess didn't get the message from... Uh, Christia Freeland, uh, uh, kicked up their heels and were blocking them getting visas to come to Canada. And then all of a sudden the story completely disappeared from our press. So we, uh, I was wondering if you, if you know, are they still in Jordan? Or are they? There's a second story uh, which uh, involves the name of a, of, of a prominent politician in this province who thinks he's a constitutional expert. That, that, that everybody agreed that Syria's constitution was defective and that Bob Ray was going to go over there and <laughs> write a good constitution for them. Uh, is this an issue in Syria? Do, are, are Syrians demanding their constitution be changed? Is there, is there really a project to change their constitution? No. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> no, and actually, I'll, I'll give you a very interesting example. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Of how well yes. democracy works in Syria. Um, Last year, there was um, an act that had been presented to Parliament, which um, I can't remember all the details, but basically people felt very disgruntled by this act because it was basically um, going to pander to some of the more extremist religious elements inside Syria. And so what actually happened was it, it went to vote at Parliament, and people had really expressed their disappointment to their various representatives. And it was actually voted out in Parliament, and it was amended down to a level where it was acceptable to the majority of people. And that's very much what I see happening for, through the extensive time that I've spent in Syria, is that the people really do have a voice. They really can affect what their representatives do inside Parliament. And I mean, that's something that I, I don't even bother thinking about trying to contact my MP in Britain. I mean, it's a complete waste of time. Same here. <laughs> Um, but uh, to come back to the idea of some of the white helmets not being allowed in, that probably correlates with what Tarek Khoury was saying, because there's still around, uh, I think it's around a hundred or maybe a few more in Jordan, and basically they've been there since July last year. So clearly there are question marks over them, and, and you know, your, your um, immigration officials are quite right to question it. But if we go back to April 2016, Raid Salah, who now calls himself the chairman of the White Homeless, was refused entry to Dulles Airport in America because Homeland Security picked up on his extremist connections. And even the US State Department spokesperson at the time had to admit, eventually, under, under duress, that that was the reason he'd been turned away, was because of his extremist connections. Funnily, that's been completely forgotten now. <laughs> You can take one from the back and wrap up, I suppose. This gentleman. Are you optimistic uh, about the future of Syria at this point? And also I have a question about what's the relationship between the ordinary Syrians and the so-called Russian occupiers? <laughs> um, am I optimistic? Well, I mean, if you can go to a country now after nine years of war and still under some of the most punishing economic sanctions I've ever seen, and yet they are still developing cancer hospitals, they're still developing technology, they're still opening new hospitals. I mean, the ridiculousness of uh, Western media reporting that they're bombing and destroying hospitals deliberately. They've probably built more hospitals or renovated more hospitals in the last three or four years than most Western countries. Um, and we have to remember, you know, that the terrorist groups were responsible for the, for the bombing and the suicide bombing of some of the most prestigious hospitals. The Al-Kindi Cancer Hospital in Aleppo was hit by um, a terrorist suicide truck. So the fact that Syria is still managing to rebuild, it's still managing to um, promote a tourism industry, 
um, right now gives me hope for the future. The people give me hope because they are so resilient. In East Aleppo, immediately after liberation, one or two days after, the streets were clean, the trees were being replanted um, in the roundabouts, the schools were reopened, people were back in the streets rebuilding, stone by stone, literally. Electricity and water was being organized to be turned back on for the areas that were liberated. Um, it has extraordinary resourcefulness and resilience. So, yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful for the future. Unfortunately, I think there is still a lot of pain for them to go through, particularly because of the economic pressures. And that is something that people should really be campaigning against, is economic sanctions. Because they never punish what, the gov what our governments claim they're punishing. They only punish the people. They only ensure the lack of medical care, the lack of food, and the lack of fuel, etc., for the ordinary people. And so economic sanctions are, are a crime in themselves, in my opinion. Um, I've just forgotten what the... Oh, the Russian... <laughs> um, I think um, the majority of Syrian people that I speak to are slightly concerned um, of Russia's creeping increase in influence in Syria. However, they're also extremely appreciative um, of the fact that Russia has enabled Syria to reach the point where it is now militarily in the sense that it has regained 85 to almost 90 percent of its territory. Um, and I think, um, I mean it's very difficult to say that without that intervention Syria would not have survived. I think it would always survive anyway, but it probably would have taken a lot longer and we would have seen a lot more um, bloodshed in the process. Um, so I think, to some degree, we have to see what happens. I think the majority of uh, the Syrian government, the decision makers in Syria, have feel that they have a very good relationship with Russia. They feel that it's a partnership. They feel that nothing is imposed upon them by Russia. Um, that things are only agreed through discussion. And I think that is in sort of direct uh, contravention of any normal US rules for occupation. Um, so I think we just have to wait and see. The, 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 the fact is that's the situation we have, is that Syria has been, if you like, the arena for effectively a low intensity, going to high intensity war between US and Russia. Um, with the alliances on both sides. And I think, you know, we, we have to see how it's going to pan out. But as regards Syria now, I'm very positive for the future for them. And I hope we learn from Syria in the future, because for the first time the history is going to be written um, by the victor against imperialism. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for that applause. I think we'll consider that our thank you applause for Vanessa. Um, that we can be here today and talk about this situation positively. So thank you to Syria and thank you to the Syrian people above all. So as we leave, there's no housekeeping chores to deal with. I would just let you know that you did find a piece of paper under your chair, perhaps. That 